حدثنا محمد بن عبيد الله قال حدثنا عبد العزيز بن ابي حازم عن نبيه عن ابي حازم عن سهل بن سعد رضي الله عنه قال السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته The Prophet Sallallahu Masjid, Sidi Salam said the Prophet Sallallahu and Abu Bakr and Siddiq at the grave, Masjid Quba, Mount Uhud, and the Shuhada, the martyrs of Uhud. That's for sure. And we mentioned this the, the other day. Many, many Muslims, Qiblatayn, Sabah uh, Masajid, they visit these places, they want to see these places, they're historic places, they have uh, historic richness, there's no doubt about that. But is it Sunnah, is it the Ibadah? to travel from distances to see them and visit them for being honest and transparent I'm not standing in front of you saying that all right just for that to be known now what's more important than this location in the masjid is the concept of Qiblatayn why is it so famous and iconic Qiblatayn how did this masjid and this building receive that name Qiblatayn obviously Qiblatayn Anyone who studies any basic Arabic grammar, he knows two directions, two Qiblas. And we all know that the original Qibla, the original location for the prayer for the Muslims was Jerusalem. Beit al maqdis right? And then Allah Azza through His wisdom, His mercy, His kindness with His servants, He mandated and He willed to change the original Qibla to another direction, which was Mecca, which was the Kaaba. So everybody knows this. So those are the Qiblatan, the two directions of prayer. Once more, Asad, you see the connection between Tafsir, Hadith, and the Sirah. They're all mixed together. I would understand this. One of the conditions of the prayer is facing the Qibla, correct? From the Shurut of the Salah. You cannot pray correctly a valid prayer unless you face the Qibla, unless you have an excuse, like you're locked up behind bars, or you're a traveler making voluntary prayers. But under normal circumstances, under orthodox conditions, you must face the Qibla, correct? So that is an issue of fiqh. And at the same time, when did that Qibla become the Qibla? That's an issue of history, tarikh, and sirah, and asbab al nuzul and hadith. So all of the Islamic sciences, they do what? They merge together. Uh, a surgeon, let's say, my focus and my expertise is or bones, the solar plex. But before I perform surgery on someone and crack their, their breastplate and reach this organ, the lung, the heart, etc., I have to be learning of what? I have to be learning of anesthesia, correct? Right or wrong? Right. I have to be learning of the skin, of the dermis, the levels, how to cut the incisions. I have to be learning of the blood, of the nervous system. There's so many other sciences that I need to just focus on the bones, and that is Al Islam. So, to be strong in Sirah, you gotta know Hadith, you gotta know Tafsir, you gotta know Fiqh, etc. All right? So, therefore, this masjid and the whole concept of two Qiblas, it pertains to four to five to six different Islamic sciences. All right, so question number one is let's make this a quick trivia, guys. Really fast, really sharp. I said, you know, I'm coming for you. When was the Qibla changed? Shoot. Take a guess. Shoot, throw a punch, do something. Uh, Say anything. The year one. Year one. Perfect attempt. When was the Qibla changed, guys? When did Allah Zoja turn it from Jerusalem to Mecca? And what year? Anybody know? Anybody want to give it a shot? A guess? Seventh year? Ten years? Good, good guess. Not necessarily right, but anybody else? Nine months after the injury. Nine months after the injury. Anybody else? All right, so. In order for us to answer this question, we have to know, first and foremost, how long did the Prophet live? 23 years. When he became a prophet. How long he remained in Mecca, and why he left what? Mecca to Medina. So there are three pieces of the Islamic timeline, guys. Three pieces. Ahmed, pay attention. The first step in the Islamic chronological history is Qabul al It's before prophethood. That's a timeline. And that is the Prophet's birth, before the Prophet was born, right? Abraha, the army of the elephants, the history of the Arabs, etc. Before the Prophethood. Then, 
when the Messenger of Allah became a Nabi, that is a, the next milestone in the timeline. You with me? So from the time the Prophet became a Prophet until something else. And that third and final milestone or landmark is going to be called what? Hijra. The Hijra. So the three ways of calculating time in Islam with regards to the Sirah. Before prophethood. From prophethood before Hijra, Hijra up until now. Everybody on the same page or not? So therefore the Prophet said he, he remained in his hometown of Mecca for approximately 13 years. 13 years. And then the Messenger of Allah he left Mecca and he went to Medina and he stayed there for approximately 11 years. 10 going on what? Going on 11. So in order for us to answer the question, why is it called Qibla chain? When was the Qibla change? We have to be aware of the what? The timelines and the sections. And that's a very important benefit. Don't forget this. Before prophethood, prophethood to Hijra, after Hijra up until this very day. And a fourth important piece is the Gregorian calendar. And knowing the dates in the Christian or Viking calendar that go hand in hand with the Islamic calendar. Everybody clear on this? All right, so the Prophet Alayhi Salaam remained in Mecca for 13 years. Next question is, did the Prophet make Salah in Mecca? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, yes or no, guys? Yes. yes, he did. The Prophet made Salah. What type of prayer did the Prophet make in Mecca? Was there wudu? Was there ghusl? Was there tayammum? He says yes. Anybody, everybody agree with this? Okay. We know Mecca, Medini. Most of the Islamic rulings Women wearing hijab, who you can marry, divorce, buying, selling, hajj, zakat, Ramadan. Nine out of ten, not all, but nine out of ten of the Islamic rulings were sent down in Medina after Hijra. But the prayer was known for a very long time. And that is why there's so many verses in Juz Ahmad that talk about what? Prayer in the earliest days of Mecca, but it wasn't necessarily mandatory. Or it wasn't necessarily mandatory based off of Zuhur, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, Fajr. Everybody clear on this? So the Prophet always made Salah. The Muslims, they always would pray. But it wasn't necessarily as it is in its final polished state and form to this day. Everybody clear on this? So before the Prophet left Mecca, he made Salah, the five daily prayers, for roughly three years. And those five daily prayers, they were made obligatory during what event? Isra and the Mi'raj When he left his home and he traveled from Mecca to Jerusalem and back in one night Everybody clear on this? So that's when the, the five daily prayers were made obligatory So from that time, the last three years of the Meccan period The Prophet and the Sahaba, they were praying towards what direction? Jerusalem. Jerusalem and not to Mecca Even though the virtue of the Kaaba was known to the Arabs the remnants of Ibrahim's way, of Ismail's way, of monotheism, it was known, but it was mixed with the uh, with shirk, the sediments of shirk. Everybody clear on this? So, the Prophet ﷺ, things were getting very hot in Mecca. Very hot for the Muslims. The Mushri corner getting bolder, more disrespectful. And it's time to leave Mecca and to go somewhere else. And that is to Medina. As the Prophet ﷺ, he made an agreement with the Ansar, they would protect him, they would keep him safe, and they would uphold Islam. So the Prophet left Mecca, went to Medina, and they kept making the five daily what? Prayers. Prayers. And the Messenger of Allah for 16 months, 16 months, 17 months, he prayed towards Jerusalem. I would understand this, but he wanted something else. And one now, some scholars they say the narration state that the <coughs> waditu, a waditu, and yusra for wajhi ila. Qiblati Ibrahim. He says, I want my face to be turned towards the way of Ibrahim and Ismail. And it states, well, they say that Jibreel said, abdun. I'm nothing more than a slave. Fadu Rabbaka wasalhu. Invoke your Lord. Ask Allah, only He can change it. And that is when Allah Azza He sent down those ayat. Allah says, Indeed, O Muhammad, we know that you're searching and we know that you're wishing. We know that you want something, so now turn your face to the sacred masjid. And that is when the Qibla was changed. Obviously, all of the Sahaba were not there with the Prophet. All of them didn't hear the ayat, they didn't see the revelation come down, and from that is this masjid. 
who some say people were praying and a Sahabi, he passed by them as they were making a Salah and he told them that the Qibla had changed. Whether it was here at this masjid that the verse was sent down or whether it was the first time that the information was passed out at mass. I brought clearness. Now, what are the wisdoms? Most importantly, like we said before, what are the wisdoms and what are the benefits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changing the Qibla? What are the wisdoms and what are the benefits? You guys, I'm listening. Benefits and wisdoms of the Qibla being changed. Why did Allah change it? And before we go to why, you gotta understand that the Qibla being changed was a big, big deal. Why was it such a big deal? Is that there were three people that spoke about the Prophet وسلم, and the Sahaba when the Qibla was changed. There were the Jews of Medina, there were the Mushriks of Mecca, and there were the Monafics of Medina. As far as the Jews, then they use this as a, a scandal, as a smear campaign. And they say, look at this man Muhammad. He claims to be upon the way of the prophets and messengers, but he turns to a different direction. All of the prophets and messengers, they all prayed towards what? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And now this man claiming that he's in line with Musa and Isa, now he's turning away from them. It's a clear proof that he's a liar and that he's misguided. That's number one. Everybody clear on this. And also they took it personal by saying that this man Muhammad, he wants to just outshine us, outdo us. He wants to oppose us. He wants to do something different than us than every single thing. And think about this today, guys. You want to pray Fajr? You want to wear your hijab? You want to grow your beard? You want to be righteous? Think about your older brother or unfortunately your mother or your uncle. And they say, everything's haram. You want to be better in everything. You want to dress differently. Why can't you keep your own culture? Why you got to dress like an Arab? Is everything bad about, about American culture? Is everything unlawful? We can't have no holidays. You got to eat different food. You got to wear different clothes. You, not, you guys not hear things like this? Yeah. So that was the attitude of the Yehud of Medina. That were the, some of the indigenous inhabitants. As far as the Mushikun, then they, they were a little more tricky, a little sly, a little more sly. They said, if Muhammad's original Qibla was originally the truth, then it proves that he was upon falsehood from day one. And he caught us to that falsehood for 13 years. And if Muhammad's original Qibla was the truth, then that mean he did what? He abandoned the truth towards what? Falsehood. So therefore, it's another proof that he's a liar. And as far as the Munafiqun, obviously then, they said that the Prophet ﷺ was confused. He doesn't know what to do. One day Jerusalem, one day Mecca, here, there. So the people of Shirk and Kufr, the enemies of Islam, they wanted to use this as a juicy, ripe opportunity to attack and to uh, scandalize the Muslims and Islam. And that is why Allah Azawajal, He said, say, The fools will chitter chatter. They'll gossip. And they'll say things. And Allah Azawajal says, <laughs> When kanat la kabiratin illa ala ladina had Allah. And indeed, it is a it was a hard thing, difficulty, except for illa illa ala ladina, except for those who want Allah had guided. <laughs> Allah gave the huda, and it became easy. I.e., the changing of the qibla from Jerusalem to Mecca was nothing more than a test. That's it. Allah was testing the people: who's going to submit? Who's going to be real? Who's going to be honest? Who's going to use it as an opportunity to scandal? So the Qibla being changed was a big, big, big deal. All right, so that's pre and that's during. What remains? Post. Post. Pre, during, now post. What were the effects or the consequences? What were the ramifications? What were the dimensions, the extent of this epic, of this event of the Qibla being changed? There were consequences. There was far reaching far-reaching dimensions with regards to history, religion, politics, and of warfare. Okay, that's the hadith of Pastor John. Oh yeah, we gotta go. Yeah. Bismillah. Yeah. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum, everybody can hear me? Yes, yes we can. All right, so we left off speaking on the uh, aftermath of the Qibla being changed from Jerusalem to Mecca the far-reaching effects okay to this very day in Islam and outside of Islam so we said that there are um, effects or there are uh, pieces or different stems of the aftermath with regards to our deen 
with regards to history, with regards to politics, and with regards to, which is, I mean, we don't get nobody in trouble. I don't want to get in trouble, but a big part of life is warfare and fighting. Human beings are aggressive creatures, just like human beings are also very defensive creatures. That's the nature of the human. And that's a long discussion with regards to changing the law's creation and why changing the law's creation is a major sin and is a reason behind the law cursing the servant. And from what we live in today, the people they want to change the creation of a law physically, whether it's a tattoo or removing this from your body or adding this to your body, doing things to your, to your body, fake things. But the concept of people wanting to change the, the mindset and the filter of the human being. They want to turn a human into something that he can't be turned into. And the more you force and smush and smudge it, the more consequences you'll see. But that's a long discussion. What's important is, is first and foremost, is the concept of, let's deal with um, politics. Another very important aspect of life, which many people turn away from, shun away from. But some people, they'll even try to remove politics from this land. And they'll say, oh no, that's not a religious issue, that's a political thing. Oh, that has nothing to do with the dean, that's just politics. There's a ruling of a law and his messenger concerning this politician and these politics. The government of men, the governing of men, ruling and running men, steering men. There are do's and don'ts, halal, haram, in politics. But we're not here to talk about that either. What's important is the change in the Qibla, it put the Arabs on the world stage, the playing stage globally, to this very one, to this very day. If the Qibla was still towards Jerusalem, be a big deal, Mecca and Medina. Everybody clear on that? As far as historical uh, impact, and that was connecting the Muslims, and obviously at that time, most of the Muslims, especially in Medina, Mecca, were of Arabian ethnicity. So it connected them with their forefather, Ibrahim and Ismail. And that's a very long discussion with regards to your forefathers. Are you allowed to take pride with your lineage, your genealogy? Should you tell your children about where they come from? So on and so forth. Number three, the third uh, extent or dimension of the effects of the consequences, the ramifications, is the religious aspect, the spiritual aspect. And that was making the Muslims to be unique and that their Qibla is like no other Qibla. And that we are separated from the Jews and the Christians. We're separated from the Jews and the Christians. We have our own unique identity our own Sharia, even though we believe in the previous prophets and messengers that came from different parts of the world, so on and so forth. But it gave Islam a unique identity by having an exclusive Qibla that wasn't what? Jerusalem. Last but not least was um, the effects with regards to uh, military affairs. And that was, anybody can take a guess why that even comes up? What does the change of the Qibla have to do with the military affairs of Islam? Ahmed, give it a shot. What's mine? Abu Mesa. Ah, Abdullahi. Abdurrahman. The prayer. La. The changing of the Qibla to Mecca that laid down the road for the conquest of Mecca. You know what I'm saying? That was, those were the warning shots. And that was opening up the door. This is the direction of the Muslims. And it has to be what? Controlled by Muslims. To this very day. I want to understand this. So the change of the Qibla was a big, big deal. All right? It was a very important issue. And there are many things that, uh, everything to this day, we live in the shade of the changing of the Qibla. All right? So that's a few things I want to share with you guys with regards to that, pertaining to that masjid and other than that masjid. And um, the last thing I'm going to say right now is, me personally, my style, like I said, I don't like to over I don't like to over romanticize things or over sensationalize things. I don't like to do that. And secondly, I like to give you guys or, or bring to your attention the most important part of everything. And it is in the building and how nice it looks and how famous and how big and how crowded and marble and gold. That's nice. That's fun. That's interesting. But the most important thing is the, the inside. What are you to get from that mentally and spiritually? 
from this building, from this expansion, from this mansion, etc. Right? And hope, I hope you guys can understand it.